Hello and welcome. I'm Nicola Fuzzi, a researcher at Microsoft Research New England, where I manage our AutoML research group. I want to welcome you to a new series from Microsoft Research titled Directions in ML, AutoML, and Automating Algorithms. Over the next year, we will host several leading researchers who will present their work in AutoML and related fields. Today, it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Amit Talwalkar, who will be telling us about algorithmic foundations of neural architecture search. Amit is an assistant professor in the machine learning department at CMU, and is also co-founder and chief scientist at Determined AI. His interests are in the field of statistical machine learning. His current work is motivated by the goal of democratizing machine learning and focuses on topics related to scalability, automation, fairness, and interpretability of learning algorithms and systems. Amit's talk will be about 45 minutes long, and we'll have a live 15-minute Q&A after. Thank you for joining us. All right, so uh, first I'd like to thank uh, the folks at Microsoft for inviting me to give this talk today. Uh, my name is Amit Tallwalker. I'm an assistant professor in the machine learning department at Carnegie Mellon University, uh, and also co-founder and chief scientist at Determined AI. Uh, so today I'll be talking about my research on algorithmic foundations of neural architecture search. This is joint work with a bunch of great students and other collaborators who uh, I'll mention throughout the talk. Right, so uh, it's a really exciting time to be in the field of machine learning. Um, <clears throat> from a research point of view, we're just seeing an explosion in the field. This you know, toy cartoon on the right here jokes about the growth of one of the premier machine learning conferences in terms of you know, the number of people attending, uh, but it's kind of more indicative of just a general excitement and increased production and output from the field. Uh, but kind of from the actual research point of view, we're seeing some really amazing applications in various domains. Uh, starting, you know, computer vision being a great example, and in particular, you know, in 2012, uh, it was kind of the start of a deep learning revolution, you could say, with uh, really impactful results on the ImageNet uh, visual recognition competition. We're seeing similar trends in industry with some of the biggest uh, organizations in the world really leaning into AI and machine learning and using it to power some really cool applications, whether it's self-driving self -driving vehicles, voice assistance, or, or translation applications. Uh, from an education perspective, we're seeing, again, something similar, leading universities, are you know, starting kicking off new AI or data science majors. Uh, Cares for kindergartners, as, as far as I know, is not a real thing. But you know, given the way the, the momentum is going, it wouldn't be surprising if that happened one day. Um, but again, get, given all the momentum and excitement around ML, a natural question to ask is what, whether machine learning is really ready for wider spread adoption. Uh, and my short answer to that question is not quite yet. Uh, but to justify it, I, I think it's useful to think about an analogy with the field of aviation from about a century ago. So this is a picture of the Wright brothers back in 1903 uh, at Kitty Hawk. And this is their infamous flight, uh, which kind of started the pioneer age of aviation. It was pretty modest in terms of absolute numbers, right? They flew for tens of seconds and hundreds of meters, but it was really, really important in the sense that it showed that powered flight was not science fiction. It was actually practically possible, right? So the Wright brothers and several other folks worked really hard over the next several years to improve this technology. And you know, the world gathered together at the World's Fair in 1910, they demoed the, the, the latest innovations. And by that point, it was culturally accepted that powered flight was really gonna change our society. But in spite of that, powered flight was very much restricted to very wealthy people or to military, to, you know, to folks fighting wars. And in fact, it took another four decades before we, re we reached the commercial jet age, right? Where we had things like jumbo jets and commercial airports that we're, we're accustomed to today. So what helped us get to the jet age of aviation? Well, it was democratized. The field of aviation was democratized by fundamental advances in aeronautical engineering. Things related to say efficiency of the turbine engine to allow jumbo jets to fly across the country or across the world or advances in automation, both in terms of how we build planes and how we test them. And also fundamental safety advances, again, in testing, but also in the creation, for instance, of regulatory agencies uh, to, to ensure safety of commercial flight. So how does this relate to machine learning? Well, I'd argue that we're actually only in the pioneer age uh, of machine learning, right? So you, could, you can sort of view the success of deep learning on ImageNet in 2012 as sort of the Kitty Hawk or, or Wright Brothers moment, where there was a real aha moment about, wow, this could be really high impact. Uh, you know, where we are today is that machine learning is culturally accepted, right? I think we as a society all fundamentally agree that machine learning is going to change our society moving forward and has the potential for really high impact. But right now, machine learning is very much restricted to a handful of the world's leading organizations. 
And the real question is, how do we get to the jet age? When we'll get there and kind of what's needed? Uh, and a high level, right? we need to kind of rethink machine learning as an engineering discipline. Uh, and in the context of this talk, what I'll be talking about today is the, the general problem and, and research area of neural architecture search, which is an important step towards democratizing machine learning. And in particular, to address some fundamental efficiency and automation issues that are kind of currently plaguing broader adoption uh, of this technology. Right, so neural architecture search, kind of broadly speaking, is focusing on the problem of how do we design neural networks in the first place? So here's a picture of Google Net. This is uh, one of you know, the deep learning model that was uh, proposed, I think in 2014, it won the ImageNet competition in 2014. And kind of the point of showing this is that, you know, hopefully you're looking at this and thinking, wow, this is pretty complicated. It's not clear to me how I would devise one of these models myself. It is over 20 layers, uh, a set of pretty ad hoc uh, sort of connections between the nodes and different layers. And kind of, you know, this is pretty indicative of how these sorts of models are uh, generated even today. Right? It's an ad hoc expensive design process, and it's really one that's really driven by experts. And so the excitement around neural architecture search, or NAS as it's called, is that it has the potential to automate and speed up this process, right? and really therefore democratize the ability for various folks to be using uh, deep learning on, on a wide range of applications. So in this talk, I, you know, we're going to be talking about neural architecture search kind of from the ground up. Uh, there's a pretty diverse audience, I imagine, who's going to be watching this talk. So I want to start by getting us all on the same page kind of giving the, giving the relevant background uh, about the field. Uh, but then I wanna talk about my research where we really you know, are asking fairly basic questions about uh, the state of the art and the field. Uh, so the first question we asked, where we started working uh, on this problem just two or three years ago. And when we started working on the problem, we had the very basic question of, you know, how good are the state of the art NOS heuristics at the problems that they're claiming to solve? The second question, uh, and, and this is motivated by the fact that a wide range of methods have been developed over the last uh, couple of years is, you know, there's various methods developed, some lots of complexity to various methods. And we kind of, under the assumption that simpler is better, we wanted to know what algorithmic components really matter. And, and finally, armed with information or answers to questions one and two, we wanted to see if we could do better. Could we come up with new, uh, new, algorithmic, new algorithmic heuristics that were simpler and principled that also did, did well empirically? Right, so with that, let's jump into the background. Um, and right, the focus here today is on neural architecture search, but you might've heard of another field called hyperparameter search. Uh, and it turns out that these two are very related, right? Neural architecture search is actually just a subfield of hyperparameter search. And so to kind of provide context and background for NAS, it makes sense to pop out and start talking about hyperparameter search briefly. Right, so the hyperparameter search problem also is aiming at solving problems related to efficiency and automation. Uh, but it's it's in some sense focusing on uh, it's it's focusing on a bigger problem, but it's starting at a different starting point. So it starts by assuming that you have a fixed neural network backbone. So in this case, this is a neural network that is you know it's a simple chain of of layers. There's a n plus one layers here, and basically you know while we start with this fi fixed backbone, there are different knobs that we want to tune. Some are architectural itself, the number of nodes per layer, the number of layers, the activation function to being be, being used throughout the network. But there's also a bunch of non-architectural components or uh, parameters that we might want to do. So things related to the objective function we're trying to solve to uh, promote uh, improved, reg uh, improved generalization, so various regularization uh, hyperparameters, but also things related to the underlying optimization algorithm that, that we're going to be using to train this model on data, things like the learning rate and the batch size. Right, so even for this problem with a fixed backbone, it's a very computationally and challenging problem with modern deep learning tasks, right? So this is, you know, quoting from a paper from three years ago uh, that was focused on neural uh, machine translation and aiming to get state-of-the-art results on an academic benchmarking problem, right? For their particular problem, they noted that training an ind a specific model on their task took days to weeks of GPU time. And moreover, to actually get a model that they were happy with that did well, did well enough on the benchmarks um, that, that, that they were looking at required them to train in total for over 250,000 GPU hours. So overall, that corresponds to training over 10,000 models and requiring 29 compute years, right? So this, you know, hyperparameter tuning, the, the traditional hyperparameter tuning task when applied to modern deep learning problems is in and of itself a very computationally expensive task. With that in mind, that kind of frames us for understanding neural architecture search and how itself, it itself is potentially even a more challenging uh, hyperparameter search problem. Right, so again, in, in hyperparameter optimization, we start with a fixed backbone and we consider 
you know, coarse grain architectural hyperparameters to tweak, as well as a bunch of non-architectural hyperparameters. So now in NAS, we, we're going to look at something sort of different. We're going to ignore the non-architectural parameters, hyperparameters altogether, but we're going to look at much more fine-grained architect, architectural hyperparameters, right? So instead of just you know, looking at nodes per layer and number of layers, we're going to consider actually what operation to perform in each layer, and we're going to consider the network connections themselves. So we could have multiple branches, we could have skip connections, and overall the complexity is, is really, really large, right? So the fundamental neural architecture search problem is, you know, no longer, you know, fiddling with a fixed backbone, but rather learning the design in the first place. Uh, and, you know, the picture that I showed here is, while pretty complex, seems, you know, somewhat tractable. But as we talked about earlier, right, modern deep learning networks look much more like GoogleNet or perhaps even more complex. This is a network, again, that's, you know, at this point, six years old. And so while in theory, NAS has the potential to replace this ad hoc and expensive process that's restricted to experts, in practice, the search spaces are just absolutely massive, which means that the kind of fully general NAS problem is just intractable. So how do we get around that? Um, well, what people have observed is, you know, and, and GoogleNet here is a great example, is that while the network itself is, is quite large and, and seemingly quite complex, it's actually made up of some repeatable components, right? So as part of the GoogleNet paper, they introduced something called the, 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 the folks behind the, this architecture introduced something called the inception module. And you'll see that this inception module is actually used over and over and over again, right? And this is pretty standard for modern uh, deep learning models. You have some fixed module or cell block that you kind of repeat over and over again to get a really large deep learning model. And so the idea behind, uh, you know, the, the, the way to kind of get around this problem of search spaces being intractable is, you know, at least, you know, the way people are currently doing it is instead of trying to learn the entire network, let's restrict the search space to learning a specific cell block and then glue that cell block together in a very kind of fixed sort of fashion. So the picture, and this is a running example that we'll, we'll be talking about throughout the talk is consider the following cell block search space. There's four nodes in the space, the edge, you know, there's edges, potential edges as shown in, in, on the slide. And on each edge, there's two possible operations that we can consider, a convolution or a pooling operation. And then the final architectures that we're gonna spit out are gonna be this cell block glued together 10 times, which, you know, via some fixed meta architecture that we're picking. Right, so this is kind of the problem that we're solving. Uh, the search space is a cell block and meta architecture search space. And this is kind of one of the core uh, ideas behind how to frame the neural architecture search problem in the first place to be feasible and tractable. With this in mind, right, we've seen some really interesting results, right? So this was the, the underlying problem that was solved for first generation NAS methods, which, which produced some really uh, impressive empirical results, right? So they focused on uh, two standard benchmarks, the Penn Tree Bank benchmark and the Safar 10 benchmark. These are both well-studied benchmarks, and there have been lots of competitors trying to, you know, inch up the leaderboard. Uh, but these first-generation NAS methods achieve state-of-the-art on both of these benchmarks, which is really impressive and caught the eye of a bunch of people. At the same time, they were incredibly expensive, right? Taking decades of compute time to actually achieve these results. And again, these are pictures of kind of the, the cell block architectures that were learned for, for each of these methods. Right, so again, you know, we see, we've seen state-of-the-art results for these first-generation NAS methods, but they were just so, so expensive that they were kind of out of reach for anyone except for, say, you know, a handful maybe of, of folks at the largest tech companies in the world. But again, the, the exciting empirical results motivated a flurry of additional research soon afterwards, trying to optimize these benchmarks and you know, at least maintain that same level of accuracy, but drastically reduce uh, the computation time. And there were two particular papers that kind of jump out from this, this kind of second generation of NAS methods. Uh, so the first is, is the ENAS paper. Uh, and, right, and, the, and now what I'm showing here, and this is going to be kind of a running chart of progress on the Penn Tree Bank benchmark. The ENAS paper was able to show, they actually were able to improve perplexity or improve accuracy on this, on this benchmark. Uh, you know, they, so they were able to beat, in terms of accuracy, the first generation NAS methods. But they were three orders of magnitude faster. So instead of taking decades of compute time, they took under a day of compute time. And that's sort of an unheard, unheard of speed up in, in general. So this is, right, this is great. This was sort of taking something that seemed really uh, promising from an accuracy point of view, but was completely out of reach for, uh, for most people to something that was actually computationally feasible. The ENOS method itself was pretty complex. Uh, about a year later, the DARTS method came out, which further increased accuracy while maintaining the same speed up gains of ENOS, uh, all, all while doing, all, all via kind of a, a somewhat simpler algorithmic uh, approach. 
So uh, my group and I started thinking about the NOS problem at around, around this time. And while we were both kind of excited about the, the results that we were seeing here, we also had some pretty basic questions about these results wanting to understand better what was really going on. Uh, and sort of the first question we asked, right? So the, the, this first line here, the, the green dot random search, random search is sort of a, is a classical hyperparameter search method. And it's tried and true, people use it in practice all the time, but it's kind of known not to be state of the art. And there's, you know, and there's clearly an enormous gap here, right? There, there's a, a break in the access because the gap is so large between the baseline, the hyperparameter search baseline used and these state of the art second generation NOS methods. But there's a question of how well do these new NOS heuristics perform when compared to maybe more appropriate hyperparameter search baselines. The second question, and this goes back to you know, the, what I was mentioning before, is that there were these a flurry of methods, and these are only the methods that came out you know, within a year or so after the first generation NOS methods. In 2019 and 2020 so far, there's dozens and you know, dozens and dozens of additional methods that have come out. Uh, there's lots of different complexity, lots of, lots of algorithmic heuristics that are being proposed. There's a question of kind of what algorithm components actually matter to, you know, to achieve the results, the, the state of the art results that are being achieved. And then the final question we wanted to ask was, you know, can we do better? You know, once we get a better understanding of what components matter and what don't, can we come up with a simple approach that outperforms what is currently state of the art today? All right. So these are kind of the three questions that uh, you know motivated our work, and then I'm going to give you some some answers to based on uh, our ongoing research. Starting with uh, how good are NOS estimates? And at the bottom of the slide here are uh, you know all my wonderful collaborators who've done a lot of a lot of the heavy lifting uh, on, on this work. Right, so kind of the, the, the punchline here is that we, to, to really ground the progress of neural architecture search, we need to consider appropriate baselines. And state-of-the-art hyperparameter search methods are the appropriate baselines for NAS, given the, the intimate connection between these two problems. So you know, what, what, is standard, what is standard hyperparameter search all about? When, how is this problem being solved? Um, right, similar to neural architecture search, you start with a search space. And here the search space can be, as we mentioned earlier, some combination of architectural and non-architectural hyperparameters. This is just an example. Uh, you then need to pick a search method to search through the search space. And if you use something like random search, that simply involves for you know, randomly selecting configurations from the search space, however many times you want. And for each of these configurations, evaluate evaluating their quality in some way. And again, the default way to evaluate their quality is to independently train the model corresponding to each of these configurations. So you take the configuration along with the data, train using some black box solver, evaluate the quality on some held out data, and then you get some score or some error. And you do this over and over again. Uh, you score each of your configurations and you keep doing this until you run out of time or money or until you know, more optimistically you're happy with, with the model that you find. But ultimately what you care about is efficiently identifying high quality hyperparameters. And efficiently here is resources consumed, time or money, Quality is typically some sort of predictive error. And as we talked about earlier, you know, training a single model can take days or weeks. So if you have a search space with say tens or dozens of hyperparameters, you're gonna be training tens of thousands of models. This is gonna take a long time. So kind of the fundamental question that we asked in the context of hyperparameter search is how can we speed it up, right? And our intuition is really simple. The intuition is that the goal of hyperparameter search in the first place is to find the best model or a very good model out of a set of putative configurations that you're looking at. And so, and, and that coupled with the fact that the way models are trained today is via some sort of iterative process, the, the idea in a nutshell is can we somehow use downsampling of iterations to find the best models more quickly? And what I mean by that, it, it can be kind of shown, uh, I think pretty well with a picture here. So this picture, each line corresponds to a different configuration that we're considering. And ultimately what we care about is finding the line that converges to the best error. So the one that's on the bottom right. We care less about models that are or configurations that are clearly suboptimal, what they actually converge to. So once we know that a model is not gonna be competitive, we no longer really care about what it's gonna converge to. And we can kind of just stop it early and not training it, not train it anymore. What we really care about is the subset of competitors that seem most promising. And we wanna train those and differentiate and find the best of those most competitive uh, models, right? The, the problem is harder than, than that kind of toy picture shows in the sense that these sequences can be non-monotonic and non-smooth. It's not clear how you safely discard a configuration, for instance. Uh, and this is work that, you know, in work that my group has been uh, pushing forward for the last half decade or so, 
we propose an, uh, a novel downsampling approach called hyperband, which kind of solves this uh, you know, safe early stopping problem, uh, provably in the sense of framing it as a multi-arm bandit problem, but also empirically in terms of achieving state-of-the-art empirical performance uh, on a wide range of benchmarks. And kind of going back to random search, it, you know, we see you know, up to two orders of magnitude speed up and oftentimes to higher performing models when running hyperband or ASHA uh, relative to, to random search. And I should note in practice, ASHA uh, is you know, an asynchronous variant of, uh, of hyperband, which allows you to you know, run this sort of approach in massive, massively parallel settings. Uh, and so hyperband and ASHA have been adopted by a wide range of open source and uh, in industrial uh, implementations of hyperparameter search. And, and kind of the, the punchline of this is that ASHA is a, an appropriate baseline for NAS, right? Uh, so kind of going back to this picture of hyperparameter search, the landscape of hyperparameter search, what something like hyperband or ASHA is doing is, you know, it's using uh, traditional hyperparameter search, search space. It's still using random search as a search method. It's just evaluating each of the configurations with partial training rather than full training. So there's a question of how could you apply something like ASHA um, on, uh, for a NOS problem? And the answer is it's very simple. It just works out of the box. All you have to do is apply it on the cell block meta architecture search space, which we we introduced a little while ago, right? So if this works out of the box, no fiddling, no tuning, no nothing. You can just run the algorithm by plugging in a different search space. So we did that. And going back to this Penn Tree, Penn Tree Bank benchmark, uh, what we see is that ASHA performs quite well. So first, it absolutely dominates previous baselines. And again, this isn't surprising. It's known from our other benchmarking work that ASHA is orders of magnitude better than, than vanilla random search. What's maybe a little bit more surprising is that it's actually comparable to ENOS, both in terms of accuracy, but also in terms of efficiency and compute time. Um, so it's, you know, this is, I think, it's interesting on its own in the sense that Classical hyperparameter or state-of-the-art hyperparameter search methods perform quite well and are very robust on neural architecture search benchmarks. But it also kind of, uh, you know, it also suggests that it's, you know, it reinforces the idea that for empirical studies, the appropriate baselines are very, very important to ground the impact uh, of research. That all said, Asha is not state-of-the-art. Darts does significantly better. Uh, and right, so our next question is sort of why? What is the delta between Darts and Asha, what about darts or what about neural architecture search heuristics and at all lead to sort of improved performance over things like Asha? All right, so that, that leads us to ask our second question uh, about what algorith algorithmic components actually matter. And you know, this is this is the taxonomy slide that, that we showed earlier, uh, showing kind of how Hyperband and Asha select search space, search method, and, and evaluation method. And kind of the, the key insight for Asha was proposing a different evaluation method that was more efficient than full training. Well, it turns out for neural architecture search, uh, various folks have proposed new evaluation methods precisely tailored for neural architecture search that are you know, more efficient and also noisier uh, ways to evaluate specific configurations. People have also considered various search methods, some borrowed from classical hyperparameter search and some designed uh, for, for NAS uh, specifically. But kind of one, once you devise this taxonomy, once you define this taxonomy, you can sort of at a course level define uh, several of the second generation NOS methods that have been proposed. Um, and in particular, as we mentioned before, ENOS and DARTS were kind of two of the notable methods in that they were highly efficient and achieved state-of-the-art empirical performance at the time of their publication. And both of them relied on uh, this weight sharing evaluation method. And so our idea in terms of trying to understand what are the minimal set of ingredients needed to achieve state-of-the-art performance and assuming that simpler is better was to see, can we apply the simplest search method, random search with this weight sharing evaluation method and see what happens, right? And so that was the insight behind our random search with weight sharing uh, approach that we proposed last year. And before I show empirical results, I think it, it's, it's worth explaining a little bit about what this random search with weight sharing method is actually doing. Um, and so this is again, the this is the cell block and meta architecture search space that we introduced before. And there's a question of, you know, how do you sample architectures from this search space? Well, the answer is really simple. You, you, know, you simply sample different edges. And for each edge that you've sampled, you subsequently sample uh, the operation that you want to perform, right? So for instance, you might sample the following edges and operations to get the first architecture. And once you have that first architecture, you might want to learn, you know, you're going to want to learn the weights for that architecture that minimize some empirical loss that I'm denoting 
generically with this, with this L. You could sample a second architecture. And again, you're gonna want, you know, if you're fully training that architecture, you're gonna uh, learn weights associate, learn, learn weights that minimize the loss uh, on that particular architecture. And kind of more generally in the full training evaluation paradigm, what you're doing is training distinct weights for each architecture, right? And so with that perspective, the objective function that ideally you want to solve falls out really naturally. Ultimately, you wanna find the best architecture in some search space over architectures. That's what the outer minimization is. And the inner minimization is that for each architecture, in order to evaluate it, you need to fully train uh, you know, weights on that architecture. So that's the, that's the inner minimization that we saw on the last slide. Right? And so kind of describing that problem, right? we're learning distinct weights for each architecture in the search space. The fundamental goal that we care about is optimizing the best architecture in the search space. Unfortunately, the cost here is really high. Right? As we talked about before, full evaluation is really expensive. It can take days to weeks per architecture. So that's not so great. We could alternatively, quote unquote, think about a shared, uh, a shared weights objective. And this, uh, this is in quotes because it's not, it hasn't really solved our problem. It is shared weights in the sense that now, instead of having two minimizations, we're jointly minimizing over the weights and the architecture alpha. And ultimately, all we really care about is learning the weights associated with the best alpha or the best architecture in the search space. So in that sense, we're only learning one set of weights. And ultimately, we're still solving the same problem. Uh, the still, the st we're still looking for the best architecture in the search space. But we haven't really done much here because it's really hard to still solve this problem, right? So we're still trying to find the best architecture, but we're searching over this search space, which is combinatorially large and discrete. So it's a very hard optimization problem that we don't know how to solve. But it is a first step towards actually thinking about shared weights in the context of random search. And so that's, that's what we're seeing here. So now we're, we're, we're kind of solving a slightly different prox, uh, we're approximating this problem in a way that it's actually solvable. We're, we're relying on shared weights, but now instead of trying to learn weights corresponding to the best architecture, we're trying to learn shared weights that work well on average, right? They, they work well for the average architecture. Um, and the benefit here is that this is, you know, the cost of actually performing this optimization when using kind of a sampling based method is not, is not so expensive. So this is actually a tractable problem. Uh, it's, solve, it's, it's making an approximation in terms of the weights solve, the, the problem we're trying to solve is different than the optimal problem we, we actually want to solve, but computationally it, it's, it's feasible. So how does a random search of weight sharing algorithm work? There, there's two steps. The first step is, is basically solving this objective that, uh, that, that I posed on the last slide. And to do that, we simply perform gradient descent on, on, on uh, a, a set of shared weights W. And to do that at each iteration, we first sample an architecture uniformly at random from the space of all architectures that we're considering. And then we perform a stochastic gradient descent update with respect to that architecture. And we update the shared weights. So essentially on every iteration, we're making a gradient uh, update, but with respect to a different architecture, but updating the same shared weights. And so in that way, we're kind of optimizing on average for the weights to be good. The second step though, once we've learned these shared weights is that we actually need to find a good architecture in our search space. And we can use these shared weights to get a good performance estimate. On average, these shared weights are supposed to be a good estimate of architectures in our search space. So we can you know, apply them for various architectures and evaluate the performance on some held out set to get uh, performance estimates and pick the best ones. So that's, you know, that, that's how the algorithm works. Let's see how it works in practice. Uh, so going back to our Penn Tree Bank uh, benchmark, what we see is on the PTB bit, uh, data set, remarkably random search with weight sharing is state of the art, uh, right? It's, it's significantly better than Enos and Asha, slightly better than Darts. Uh, and these are results as of, I think a year and a half ago. Uh, but to the best of my knowledge, I think random search with weight sharing is still state of the art uh, on Pen Tree Bit. Right? Earlier, I, I talked about two, two benchmarking data sets, PTB and Safar 10. The story is roughly similar with Safar 10, but not exactly the same. Um, it is the case that, you know, Asha, absolutely dominates previous random search baselines and is comparable with Enos. Um, random search with weight sharing is also outperforming Enos and it's close to darts, though not quite the same and it has higher variance. Uh, but kind of beyond that, there's this point that since you know, random search with weight sharing has come out, additional uh, kind of extensions of darts, in this case, PC darts have come out, which have really dominated both darts and random search with weight sharing. And so basically at this point, gradient-based weight sharing methods are state-of-the-art uh, on, on the Safar 10 benchmark and on other benchmarks as well. 
And right, so this leads us to ask our final question, which is, can we, you know, can we improve upon gradient-based methods? Um, right, so can we, can we do so with simple principled methods of our own? Right, okay, so to kind of uh, propose new methods, we kind of need to first understand what the gradient-based uh, optimiza optimization objective is doing. And kind of going back to the objectives we talked about before, the original weight sharing objective was trying to jointly minimize the weights uh, and the architecture. And this was a hard problem because the architecture space was discrete and combinatorially large. One way to kind of relax this objective to make it tractable is to you know, solve a different problem. And instead of trying to minimize over uh, the architectures, architecture space, we can optimize for a random architecture. Another thing we could do is to relax this objective such that it's completely continuous. And as a result, we can perform gradient-based optimization on it. And that's what gradient-based, you know, as the name sounds, as the name suggests, that's what gradient-based optimization uh, NOS methods are doing. So to provide a little bit more intuition, and in particular for kind of what methods like DARTs are doing, they're taking what's the so-called mixture relaxation approach, right? So this is, you know, going back to our, our running example about the cell block search space, uh, but now let's in particular focus on a particular edge, the edge between nodes one and two in the cell block search space, right? So we know that ultimately that if this edge is included in, in an architecture, we need to decide between one of two operations on this edge, either a convolution or a pooling operation in this running example. But what the mix mixture relaxation approach says is that at least during training, don't enforce this hard constraint on one or the other, instead relax the constraint to allow some sort of combination of pooling and convolution. So for instance, you know, we might say that there's a distribution over these different operations and theta pool could be 0.6 and theta conv could be 0.4 or theta conv is 0.7 and theta pool is 0.3 or, or whatever. And again, the benefit of doing this is by replacing that original minimization in blue, which includes that uh, the space alpha, which is discrete and combinatorially large, by relaxing that to instead optimize over capital theta, which is a continuous relaxation of A, that allows us, that allows us to provide gradient based, you know, perform gradient based optimization uh, on, on this new relaxed objective. Um, right, so to kind of, you know, now that we kind of understand what gradient based optimization is doing, we, we want to think more about kind of how can we improve upon it. And to do that, we kind of need to define what better, what, what improvement looks like. Right, so the first thing that we would want is to be able to show that. Uh, you know, a method can converge, right? So uh, before the, the work that I'm talking about here, there, there was no convergence results for darts or for, you know, darts-like methods. Uh, and, you know, while convergence isn't the only thing you care about, it is nice to know that the, the method that you're running will complete, for instance, in your lifetime. So convergence just on its own is a nice property to have. Uh, even better would be able to have a method that converges faster uh, and also converges better. And by better, you know, I'll, I'll get to what better means uh, in a second, in the next slide. So uh, to do that, we need you know, to understand kind of what better means. Uh, we need to understand a little bit more about what the mixture, relaxa mixture relaxation algorithm is doing, right? So we talked about uh, minimizing this objective, this relaxed objective, and because it's continuous, we can optimize uh, over both the mixture weights and the shared architecture weights using some gradient-based uh, optimization. But of course, the, the output of this is going to be, you know, a set of shared weights, but also some theta, which, it's, which is a mixture of the operations that you want to perform. But ultimately, what you care about is one particular operation, right? So, you know, if the weights that you learn say that theta pool is 0.6 and theta conv is 0.4, that's not, that's not the architecture you care about. You kind of need to do some sort of subsequent rounding step to, you know, to pick that specific operation that you care about. So if theta pool is bigger than theta conv, you would just, you know, 0.6 is bigger than 0.4, so you would say that the operation is pooling here. In fact, you can use some similar sort of rounding to pick edges themselves on the final architecture, as in many cases you have constraints on the total number of edges that you want to include um, <clears throat> in, in, in the cell block architecture that you, that you come up with. So given that you're doing the subsequent rounding step, right? So you're you're first relax doing a relaxation to make learning of the shared weights easier. But as a result of doing that, you're required to do a subsequent rounding step. It kind of makes sense that the sparser your solution is in terms of thetas in the learning step, the less of an impotence uh, the rounding step is going to be on you, right? So as an example here, 
if theta pool is 0.6 and theta conv is 0.4, and we have to round and only uh, consider the pooling operation, that's, that's fine, but it's kind of, there's a fair bit of uncertainty as to which of the operations is better. Alternatively, if theta pool was 0.99 and theta conv was 0.01, you would imagine that the rounding is not gonna hurt you as much because the solution is in some sense sparser. So sparsity in, uh, in, these, uh, in these thetas, in, in, the, in the mixture weights, is beneficial knowing that you have to do the rounding afterwards. And basically our insight is that we wanna explicitly account for the geometry here, account for the fact that we're learning these thetas and we want to learn them, we want them to be on the simplex, meaning we want them to effectively be probability distributions by accounting for the fact that, you know, we're, we're in the simplex geometry directly, we can, uh, we can encourage sparsity and also get faster convergence results. Right. And in particular, it's known that exponentiated gradient descent, which is a, uh, an alternative gradient-based optimization routine to vanilla gradient descent, is particularly well-suited for a simplex geometry. In convex settings, we can, it, it's been shown that it's provably faster in terms of convergence than vanilla gradient descent. Uh, and, it's often, and it's known in non-convex settings to encourage sparser solutions. And in particular, in the context of, of neural architecture search, we propose a family of methods called gradient-aware exponentiated algorithms, or GAIA, where we, can, we generalize the known results from the convex settings uh, about convergence to the NOS objective to probably show faster convergence uh, for GAIA-based approaches. And incidentally, our results also apply to things like DARTs, providing the first general convergence results for those methods themselves. Um, our GAIA approach is applicable to a, a various methods, in particular DARTs, PC DARTs, GDOS, and others. Uh, and we empirically observe the benefits of sparsity. So I'll show you next empirically what, what I mean by that. Uh, so here's one example where we apply Gaia to PC darts and we compare Gaia with vanilla PC darts. And what we're planning here on, on the x-axis is number of epochs during training um, of the shared weights and the, you know, and the, and the, the mixture weights, uh, the thetas. And the y-axis is the entropy, right? And what we're looking at in particular is at the entropy of the mixture weights here. And remember that the, the mixture weights here are distributions over operations. And right, the entropy of a distribution is uh, <clears throat> minimized for, you know, for, or it is smaller for sparser distributions. When all of the mass is on one point, it's gonna be the lowest entropy. And so what we see is that Gaia converges to much lower mixture weights than, than PC darts, demonstrating that it's learning a sparser solution. Right? And we see similar sort of uh, lower entropy uh, results for the mixture weights uh, on other data sets as well. So how does this translate though to actual empirical performance? Remember again, uh, our hypothesis is that sparser mixture weights are gonna be less detrimental in the context of rounding and as a result lead to improved empirical results uh, uh, on the various benchmarks. All right, so uh, going back to the Safar 10 results where, uh, where we last left it, right? PC darts was state of the art and was significantly outperforming random search with weight sharing. Well, now applying Gaia, Gaia PC darts, we can get state-of-the-art results. This is on Safar 10 with the dart search space. We see a similar trend for ImageNet on the dart search space. Uh, new, thankfully, new benchmarks have uh, emerged for uh, the, the NOS problem in general. Uh, one, of, one of the popular ones is NOS Bench 201. So we apply Gaia uh, on NOS Bench 201 as well. And what I'm showing here first is, right, so uh, NOS Bench 201, along with releasing this benchmarking problem in pre-computed results for every configuration of the search space, they also ran uh, various search methods to, to evaluate their various performance. And so the ones in blue are traditional hyperparameter search methods. The ones in purple are weight sharing NOS methods. And what you see is that the, uh, the traditional hyperparameter search methods pretty drastically outperform the weight sharing NOS methods. And in particular, NOS is catastrophically poor. Basically the architecture that it learns is pretty much is a linear model, which includes just skip connections. Uh, and the hypothesis is that really the rounding step is what, what's hurting it here. So we apply darts, uh, we, we, we apply Gaia on top of darts. Uh, and what we see is that Gaia outperforms other methods, all the other methods. Um, and what's really cool is that, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the, uh, all the configurations for the search base were pre-computed. And so we know what the optimal configuration is. Uh, and the, result, the results for Gaia darts are nearly optimal uh, on, on this benchmark. And right, so NOS Bench 201 contains three different data sets. So here I'm showing the results for Safar 10, but we see similar results for Safar 100 and ImageNet 16 as well. 
so kind of stepping back, uh, right, the, the kind of motivation behind this talk was kind of to ask kind of fundamental questions about the state of NOS and NOS heuristics. Uh, the first question was, you know, how good are NOS heuristics at solving the problems that they're aiming to solve? Uh, and I'd argue that, you know, what we've seen is that they're quite promising, but at the same time, hyperparameter search methods like ASHA are competitive baselines uh, and arguably significantly more robust on, on new problems, at least today. Uh, in terms of what algorithmic components matter, uh, what we've seen is that weight sharing is really powerful, random search is really powerful, and gradient-based optimization seems to work well. Of course, this is not an a exhaustive list of what matters, but in terms of achieving state-of-the-art today on the benchmarks that the community is looking at, this seems to be uh, sufficient. Finally, we asked, can we do better uh, with simple principled methods? And what we showed was that, yes, in fact, we can. Uh, we can augment existing gradient-based optimization methods via gradient-aware approach, which endows these methods with provably faster convergence guarantees and also achieves state-of-the-art empirical results. Uh, so you know, finally, uh, to conclude, you know, the, the fourth question that I, I want to briefly ask is, you know, kind of have we solved the NOS problem? Right? There's been a lot of work on this problem. Uh, I showed methods that get you know, better results on existing benchmarks. To be very clear, we have not solved the NOS problem. There's a lot of work left to do. I think we've, in the last few years, the community has uh, laid the foundation in terms of even posing the problems in the first place, coming up with really interesting algorithmic primitives uh, to start solving these problems. But you know, there's a long way to go before this problem is, is truly solved. And there's a bunch of interesting directions for NOS, two in particular that I think are really important. Uh, one is thinking about uh, system L concerns. Right, so the you know the, the workflows currently needed to actually run neural architecture search are quite complex. Um, <clears throat> they're very dependent on random initializations. They're dependent on various software configurations, whether you're using TensorFlow or PyTorch, uh, what versions of different software you're using. They're dependent on uh, hardware configurations as well. And the combination of all of these different uh, you know these configurations in the workflows themselves means that even in the research setting, reproducibility remains a major issue. So these methods in some sense are brittle and they kind of lack reproducibility. Moreover, NOS itself is not something you do in isolation. Uh, you know, for instance, after you find the best architecture that you wanna, uh, you find the, the architecture from whatever NOS method you're using, you typically wanna perform an additional hyperparameter search sweep on non-architectural parameters. You often wanna train on much larger data sets, possibly in some sort of distributed training sort of fashion. And so integrating your, you know, integrating NOS with other training functionality is really important. Uh, and just you know, a quick shout out to my startup. These are the sorts of concerns that were you know, generally concerns related to uh, training uh, of deep learning models are things that, you know, SysML concerns of training deep learning models are things that uh, we at Determined AI are looking at with NOS functionality being uh, one, one major uh, area that we're looking at. The second area uh, in terms of future work for NAS uh, involves sort of you know, uh, existing or remaining automation and efficiency concerns. So remember, we, we posed the uh, cell block meta architecture search base in the first place to sort of, to balance the kind of intractableness of the, the fully general NAS search base with the desire still to kind of learn new architectures. And it's a, it's a perfectly reasonable idea, it's led to, uh, interesting results on reasonable benchmarks, but it also very much, the, the search bases themselves, these uh, cell block search bases heavily rely on expert knowledge and domain knowledge. So if we wanted to apply NOS on a new domain, or if we wanted to apply NOS without being an expert, you know, we kind of, it, 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 automation is still a, a, a real concern here because how to design the search space in and of itself remains an art rather than sort of an automated sort of uh, process. And on the flip side, moving completely to a fully general search base, as we talked about before, remains intractable. So kind of balancing the ability to have more general search bases that are more automated while still uh, alleviating potential efficiency concerns remains uh, an interesting open question. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll conclude. Uh, I should, a few last notes. Uh, check out my website for the very, you know, papers and blog posts on the various things that I talked about today, Hyperban, Asha, random search with Wei Chang or, uh, or Gaia. And also, uh, I want to once again thank all my collaborators uh, who, who have worked on with, with the various research, but in particular, uh, the two students who drove a lot of this research. First, Liam Lee, who recently graduated from CMU and is now working, working at Determined. Um, and second, Misha Kodak, who is a 
uh, soon to be third year PhD student and is actually interning uh, at Microsoft right now. Uh, so with that, thank you. And uh, I'm excited to uh, take questions.